A little while ago, I released a video talking about what I think are the best uh, interview questions to prepare for if you're going in for a role for a uh, systems administrator or a systems engineer. Like a systems admin is uh, somebody who's just managing day-to-day -day server stuff, cloud, security of your server infrastructure. An engineer is a little bit more, slightly different to that, but they're a little bit more now design architect driven. But ultimately, the roles are interchangeable. Different companies are gonna call it different things. But uh, here are the things that I think that you should be preparing for. At least some of the top questions that I would say if you're going in for a sysadmin, sysengineer interview. Uh, as I said, I did one of these a little while ago. A little bit out of date now because the world of tech is changing so quickly and there's all these new technologies that are out there that I think uh, people in companies are wanting a lot more out of their sysadmins and sysengineers. They want more skills. They want them to have better experience in certain things. But here's the thing. I'm gonna give you the questions and I'm gonna give you some sample answers. However, 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 every company is gonna be different, right? So when you're preparing for an interview, one of the best things that you can all, you know, always do is make sure that you have read the position description really, really well. And if you're going in for an interview, that you ask the right questions to get the best you know, responses, and then you form your questions out of that. You get ready for that based on your PD, okay? Uh, also, you're not gonna lie. Don't say that you have the skills in this thing if you don't, because you know what? I've interviewed enough people that you can tell they're just fudging the truth. And I'm straight away in my head gonna go, man, this person does not know what they're talking about and I'm gonna discount them. So I would say be honest if you don't know the answers to some of these. If you're not a sysadmin or an engineer now, what I did when I first jumped into that role is I went and started deploying the stuff myself. So I had my own home server, my own home lab at home, and that's how I started learning some of these things. Or I went and did my own research. I Googled a whole bunch of stuff so that I could be ready. Subscribe, click on the button, on the bell. We release videos on all things tech as well. Let's jump onto it. Now, questions that I'm going to start with for the most part is um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Now, when I'm asking somebody to tell me a little bit about themselves, I want to know two things. Again, every company is going to be slightly different, but I like to know personally, tell me a little bit about yourself. What do you enjoy doing? That sort of stuff. But then professionally, be able to give me a good overview of who you are. What does your technology career look like? How did you start off in tech? Like what got you into tech in the first place? Why are you excited about technology? Because for me, very often, the thing that I'm looking for more than anything else is somebody who is excited and passionate about technology. If they don't really care about tech outside of work, like what's the point? I think, look, for me, I, I think tech is like one of the best industries to work in. I mean, technology is changing so, so quickly and it's exciting because you have to stay up to date with all of this sort of stuff, but it's just cool playing around with tech, hardware, software. It's just, I think it's really, really cool. So when you're preparing uh, answers to some of these questions, have a good story. Have a good story, not just what you did, but be able to explain it in a nice, meaningful way, a story about where you are in your career, how you moved from one role to another, what technologies you're good at, what technologies you're currently learning, and maybe what you wanna be looking at doing in the future. Now from here, you can move into a little bit of an area where you may have a bit of a hybrid list of questions. Questions that are a little bit more behavioral oriented and questions that are a little bit more technically oriented. Behavioral questions would be like, tell me about a time when this happened and how did you respond? Technical is, what is DNS? Okay, they're the sort of the two sorts of questions. But what I like to do is I like to form my questions in a way that are a combination of the two. I don't wanna just know the answer to the thing. I'd love to know practically a, a experience that you've got in that. Like when did you, I mean, I mentioned DNS. Tell me about a time when you used DNS or when you set up DNS and how did you build it? How did you deploy it, right? Something like that. And was it a positive experience? Was it a negative experience? Tell me a little bit more about that, okay? so. Questions of behavioral and technical may be fairly common, right? So some of these questions that I'll be asking are gonna be combinations of the two. And also I'm gonna group these into, into different sorts of categories. I'm gonna group them potentially into server-based questions, right? I'm gonna think about what does a systems administrator, systems engineer actually do? Well, they're gonna deal with servers, they're gonna be dealing with storage, they're gonna be dealing with Active Directory, cloud, 
automation, cybersecurity, and a whole bunch more, right? So I like to sometimes group my questions based on that, but remembering that my questions are going to be based on what I need for the role, yeah? That's very, very important. So tell me, in the most simplest form, what is a server? Sounds simple, right? How would you define, how would you explain to me what is a server? What is the function of the server? What is the point of a server? You can talk here about server hardware. You can talk about the blade servers. You can talk about the rack servers. You can talk about the tower servers. You can talk about servers like the hardware having lots of different sorts of cards. You've got fiber channel cards. You've got multiple ports for ethernet. You've got multiple powers. You can stick a lot more RAM. You've got dual CPUs. This is the hardware side of things of servers. Then you've got the software side of things when it comes to servers. Well, we're now talking about server software, Windows Server, Linux servers, right? You can CentOS server, Red Hat server. You can talk about virtualization hypervisors where you're talking about VMware, we're talking about Citrix, we're talking about Hyper-V, where you're converting servers into hypervisors, essentially serving the organization a specific service, right? A server provides a service to lots of Computers, so computers on a network that need to access files, they may be stored on a file server, right? That may be one example. Explain to me, how do you secure your server? What are the processes that you put in place to make sure that my servers are going to be safe and secured? Very important, especially in the world of everyday reading the newspaper and going, oh, there's been another cyber breach or there's some data that leaked out to the dark web. It's a scary world. So I want to know, as somebody who's hiring you, how do I secure my server? Talk about endpoint protection software, you know, antivirus software. What sort of solutions are you using? Are you using CrowdStrike? Are you using Sophos? Are you using Defender? Maybe explain a little bit about these technologies. Talk about how servers interact with your network. So you may be having to work closely with your network engineers, with your cybersecurity experts as well, that all of the servers have IP addresses, that they maybe have different VLANs, they're part of different subnet groups, yeah? They're all routing traffic through firewalls. You've got certain ports that are gonna be open, certain ports that are gonna be shut. You're gonna be running server software onto these computers that need to have, that need to be properly secured, right? The applications that are running on there, well, those applications themselves need to be secured and secured properly. It's important here to talk about patching, that you wanna make sure that you're gonna be patching the server quite regularly because patches are released for good reasons. Patches are released because Microsoft has said, hey, There's a vulnerability on Windows Server or there's a vulnerability on our new SQL Server. Here's a new patch. And if you're gonna be like, ah, I don't patch stuff, bit bit of a problem, bit of a problem. You need to be patching your stuff to make sure that all these vulnerabilities are fixed. And then we can group certain things here together. We can group here uh, DNS. Tell me a little bit about DNS. Tell me a little bit about DHCP. Talk to me about different DNS records. Tell me an example when you have set up DNS records. Talk to me about DHCP. What is DHCP? Why do I use DHCP? And then maybe talk a little bit more about Active Directory. What is the role that Active Directory has, yeah? So if I'm talking about DNS, I'm talking about A name records, C name records, I'm talking about PTR records. I'm talking about that DNS's purpose is to translate IP addresses into a human readable form, into a host name that I actually understand. I don't have to remember 192.168.1.364,000. It's not really an IP address. I don't have to remember the IP address. I need to understand that that is maybe DC01 prod. That is my production domain controller. Based on the name, it then resolves back and checks against my DNS server. Of course, out on the interwebs, every website that you visit has got a DNS behind it that's resolving it. We're referring here now to DHCP. Well, your DHCP, of course, is dishing out IP addresses out to devices on your network, to end user devices, to desktops and laptops. If you've got mobile devices, phones, tablets, they're gonna get an IP address from somewhere. Printers need to get IP addresses from somewhere. All of these devices, your phones, need to go out to your network and go, hello, is there anything here acting as a DHCP server? DHCP goes, yep, here I am, here's an IP address. Pretty important to know. Understanding about lease times, understanding that when an IP is assigned, they only have a certain amount of lease. So maybe you have a lease of seven days against a computer. That computer has that IP for seven days. At the end of the seven days, it goes back to the DHCP server and says, hey, 
Give me a new IP address, pretty important. Then you've got Active Directory. What's the deal with Active Directory? Well, you're gonna be managing users, computers, security groups, yeah? You've got all of this management inside Active Directory. You've got organizational units, so you can nicely manage things. You can assign things like group policies against those organizational units in Active Directory. This is where you're gonna be managing accounts, password resets. A new person starts in the organization, they have to have an AD presence in there. A new computer is built, needs to be talking to AD. Now, of course, in the world of AD nowadays, you've got on-premise AD, and you've got cloud-based AD. You've got AD, Active Directory locally, that is run on a domain controller, and then you've got AD in the cloud, or Azure AD, or Entra, which is now sitting in the Microsoft space, yeah? Azure now has its own version of Active Directory. In a lot of companies nowadays, there may be a hybrid environment where you've got cloud and you've got on-premise Active Directory with a sync link between these two called AD Connect to make sure that the traffic flows between the two. So it's not uncommon nowadays for computers to be authenticating against an Active Directory that is in the cloud as opposed to locally on a server. Now on the topic of cloud, you need to tell me a bit about your experience with hybrid environments. When have you worked with a hybrid environment? Explain to me what a hybrid environment is, why would I need to have a hybrid environment, and what are your preferences over hybrid, over cloud, over on-premise? Of course, when we're talking about hybrid, we're talking about an on-premise environment, on-premise being that you've got infrastructure, you've got tech locally on your in your company, inside of your building, in a data center that is on-premise, yeah, on-premises. And then you've got cloud tech, you've got AWS, you've got Azure, you've got Google, they're, they're, they're the big ones anyway. You've got tech that is now sitting up in the cloud. Hybrid, it's a hybrid, it's a bit of both. You know, like an electric car, you've got electric cars, you've got diesel, you've got petrol cars, and then you've got hybrids that have a bit of both. So explain to me the benefits of the cloud, the benefits of on-premise, really depends, right? It really depends on the company, really depends on the business need. And that's a really good answer to have as well, is it really depends on the business. What is the business requirement? What is the business need? What does the business do? The answer is not always, the cloud is better. Stick it all up in the cloud. Or no, the cloud is a bit too risky. There's a lot of security holes. We want to stick it all on premise. I don't want to know that. I want to understand the benefits of the cloud, the benefits of on premise, and maybe how hybrid works together, where I've got environments of both. And I think for the most part, most companies are hybrid. There's not very many companies that are 100% cloud. Some of them are, and they're generally gonna be places that are um, fully remote, like a company that works fully remote. There is no office. Well, for the most part, they're gonna be fully cloud-based, right? They're gonna be fully cloud. But if a person has to go into an office, then that office needs to have some sort of a comms cabinet, needs to have some Wi-Fi access points, needs to have a switch somewhere. Yeah, so it's sort of on-premise, even though the tech could be in the cloud. So of course, if we're talking about on-premise, we're talking about the cloud, we're talking about hybrid, we're talking about all of our servers, our networking, our storage, where is that stuff stored? What are the benefits of one or the other? How would you ensure that my server doesn't go down? How can you ensure that my application, maybe I'm running a website, how do you ensure that it stays up as long as possible? What can you tell me about that? Tell me your experiences, yeah? This is where we're now talking about the topic of good practices around high availability and redundancy. We mentioned security, right? And this is a point where you talk a little bit about the security, the importance of securing that tech, importance of securing the server, importance of securing the underlying applications. If there's a database that's running, if there's a web app that's running or another application that is running, you've got to secure the application side of things. You've got to secure the database side of things. But then ultimately, we don't want that server to go down. Is the server on-premise? Is the server in the cloud? Is the server a physical server? Or is the server running in a hypervisor? Physical server being a physical box running Windows Server or Linux? Or is it running something like VMware acting as a hypervisor, and then you've got a VM sitting inside of it, right? Maybe in a vCenter environment. So what you can do is you can think about examples in your career where you have played around with servers. What is the architecture? What is the setup of the server look like? This is a good opportunity for you to ask them questions so you have a little bit more context about exactly what the server looks like. 
right? What is the infrastructure look like? What is the technology? Is it cloud? Is it on-premise? Is it physical? Is it virtual? Yeah, at least if you understand that, it then helps you to form the correct answer. Because then we're talking about, well, how do we keep it up and running? Really depends on the sort of tech that's running. We're talking about high availability. We're talking about redundancy. We wanna make sure that we have multiple levels of failure, yeah? If the server goes down, there's another server to take its place. Or there's a server that is mirrored, yeah? So if this one goes down, it's fine. All of the load goes over to here. If it's running in a hypervisor, let's say it's running in VMware, is the host, the physical ESXi host, VMware ESXi host, do you have two of them? And are they running in a cluster with high availability built into the cluster? So that if one of our physical host dies, the other one takes over. Then we can think about the physical hardware itself, right? The physical server. Let's talk about a physical server in a data center. Well, behind it, you've got multiple ethernet points. You've got multiple powers. Is there multiple powers? Do you have dual powers on a physical computer, right? If one of the power things goes down, is there another one to take over? If there are multiple ethernet points, all right? If the ethernet cable goes down, the ethernet cable has a problem or the switch that that ethernet cable is running into fails. Well, sometimes what you could do is you could have a server with two network cards, with two ports on each of those network cards so that you've got high availability that if a network card dies, you're fine. If a port that runs into a switch and the switch dies, you're fine because you've got another network point that's running into a different switch. So you've got multiple lanes of traffic and you can do the same sort of stuff from a high availability on the cloud perspective. You can set up multiple points of failure in the cloud. Virtualization, where well, you build multiple virtual switches. There's lots of ways that you can make sure that you can stay up as long as possible. But then also, if you do go down, this is a good opportunity for you to explain a good process that you may have around backups and be able to recover services as quickly as you can. Now, on the topic of high availability, on security, how can you guarantee the best performance? How do you manage resources on your tech that you're gonna be managing? Your cloud tech, your on-premise tech, your virtual, your physical tech. How can you guarantee good performance against it? You've got to think about resource management. What are the resources on the servers? Do I have enough RAM? Do I have enough CPU? Do I have enough hard drive space? Is it connected to like a storage unit, like a SAN or RENAS? Is there enough grunt in there? Is there enough capacity to grow, right? Like the question that I'm always asked is, well, how many VMs can I be building on a server? Well, it really depends. How much resources do you have on the server will determine how many VMs I can build on that server. And then ultimately, how many of those VMs can be running at the same time? Because if this is poorly set up, you can actually have maybe, let's say 20 VMs running on one physical box and they're all running fine. But if you don't have proper like resource pool set up, if you don't have proper redundancy set up from that perspective, you could have one server that is being DDoSed or that server is just getting really, really hungry. It's using all these resources. It's gonna go to VMware or Hyper-V and say, give me all these resources. I want to hog them up all for myself. Every other VM potentially within that host is going to be directly affected as a result of this one VM that's been very, very greedy with resources. So you wanna make sure that you are spreading the load equally, that you've got proper policies in place to be able to say, hey, no, you're only allowed this amount of resource and that's it, that's all you got. Because if you're allowing everything all the time, then you're gonna have some problems. Yeah, we don't want that to happen. How would you protect me from a DDoS attack? Hey, distributed denial of service. You know what this is? This is a, a, a pool of bad, bad people or a pool of computers bringing down a website. I've got a website and it's just getting multiple commands, hits all the time from all over the place and it just gets overwhelmed. It just gets overwhelmed that the, the website carks itself. The website just starts to run really, really poorly. So you need to put processes in place to protect yourself from a DDoS. Pretty important to do this. How would you do it? Well, we're talking about high availability. We're talking about redundancy. We're talking about failover. If this server is getting hammered, go over to here. Behind the scenes from an architecture perspective, have you set up your server with proper architecture so that you have multiple points where a command goes here, a command goes here, a command goes here. Like a technology that I like to use would be one called HA proxy. Really, really good piece of tech to be able to spread the load. But also, 
if you're talking about from a website DDoS perspective, maybe stick it behind this service called Cloudflare. Really good service to be able to protect things. Have the right software inside of your network, security software inside of your network with the whole purpose to be able to detect DDoS so that if it's detecting some sort of abnormal behavior, reroute things. You have the ability to shut things down, to reroute things to a different area, change the IP addresses. They've got lots of different options around you being able to protect yourself from DDoS. Now, I'm always going to ask somebody, tell me about a time when something failed that you were looking after, something that you were managing that failed. And how did you identify what had happened? And how did you resolve this thing? Tell me about the troubleshooting steps that you actually followed. Very, very important for me to understand your analytical mind. How does your brain work? This is where you think about potentially the OSI model. If you don't know about the OSI model, go and do a bit of Googling about OSI and all of the different levels. I mean, a lot of techs that I know don't actually know about the OSI model, even though that they do troubleshooting, they are sort of following these steps. You know, you want to start with the physical, you want to check that the physical stuff, you then move up to networking, you check the software, you check the applications. There's all these different levels in OSI, right? So it's something good to explain that. Uh, first and foremost, you need to understand the problem. Now, this is going to be very, very specific. So this is very, very important. As you as an interviewee, prepare some uh, answers or some examples to this question because you probably will get asked. At least I know I will ask this question. Examples of when things actually went wrong. When, when you stuffed up, when you messed up, or when something was outside of your control and you didn't know how to fix it, what did you do? Run me through the steps that you followed and then how did you resolve it? Along with this whole exercise, you need to be talking to the right people, right? If you're in a company that has other IT people, how did you interact with other people in IT? How did you interact with your manager, right? Who was asking you to fix this? Did you have any involvement with talking to users out on the floor? What was that communication look like? Got to explain that. Tell me about a time when you were thrown into a situation that you did not know how to resolve, All right? This could be an example where you have been asked to do something technically and you don't know how to fix it, All right? You are the server person. You know a lot about servers. You know a lot about virtualization, but then there's an issue on the SAN. The SAN storage pool has just broken or it's run out of disk space. You don't know about the SAN. You don't know what to do. Or maybe there is a storage person that you work with that's off sick and now you have to fix it. I want to know how your brain works to be able to resolve an issue that you don't understand very much technically. Okay, so this is where, again, your analytical mind is going to come very, very handy. Understanding at least the high level complexity from a tech perspective, how all the bits sort of work together, but also remembering that you may not always have somebody to rely on. The person that maybe is responsible for that may not actually be available. The firewall person is sick. The networking person is sick. There's an issue on the router. You need to fix it. You're the guy, you're the systems administrator. You need to fix it. Tell me how. Hey, there's a lot of material available online. There's lots of stuff online. There's lots of awesome community people online. There's the vendor that you can speak to. Let's say there's Cisco. You can call Cisco up if you've got an engagement with them. So at least understanding your troubleshooting, what you're trying to do, that you're trying to get it fixed, that there's lots of vendors, lots of suppliers that you can work with to try to resolve those issues. I don't need to necessarily know the exact answer. I just need to understand how do you process this? What is your process of troubleshooting an issue that you're not as familiar with. Hey, I want to know a bit about AI. I need to know about artificial intelligence or machine learning or AGI. Uh, how are you using it? Really, every techie should be at least exploring AI because AI is going to change the way that you work. So I'm going to ask questions around how you use AI. How have you used it previously? Uh, how do you think you'll use it in future? How has AI benefited you? How has AI made you a bit scared about what the future looks like, all right? Because really, AI is just gonna make your job easier or make your job harder. If you're not on top of your stuff, AI is gonna take over, right? A lot of the stuff that you had to do manually before, AI can do it for you. You know, in the olden days, you had to create a script and you had to go and figure out how to create this PowerShell thing to do this thing. AI, tell me how to do it and it'll just do it. How do I go set up a new Intune policy? I had to go and figure out how to do that or do some training. AI, how do I do this? 
So from an AI perspective, it helps you out. Think of AI as your personal assistant. You know, you're a sysadmin, you've now got yourself a personal assistant that can help you out. It's not gonna do all the job for you because you're gonna have to go and check and verify what AI is doing to make sure it's accurate because sometimes it's not completely accurate in everything. But you need to be learning how to use AI to make your life better, to work better. I love using AI for creating policies, for creating how-to guides. If I'm working with staff and I'm deploying a new thing for staff to use, a new application for staff to use, use AI to help you develop something new supporting your staff. Understand at least some of the key technologies in AI. What are the big vendors, the big players in AI? Microsoft is using AI. Apple is using AI. Google is using AI. They're all using AI. It's only gonna be growing and growing and growing. And staff in a company are gonna be concerned about AI and what it's doing. So you need to understand what it's doing. You need to understand from a privacy perspective what you need to be concerned about if you need to be concerned about anything. How do you prioritize competing tasks? We're all busy. All of us are busy. There's lots of stuff going on all the time, yeah? You may work in a company that has a ticketing system. You don't know whether they've got a ticketing system. So this is where uh, having a ticketing system comes in very, very handy because you can use a ticketing system to prioritize your tasks. You know exactly what task you need to complete and when. A ticketing system may you know, um, have a SLA against it and may have tickets logged as critical, high, medium, and low. So that you as a sysadmin know, well, you need to deal with the big ticket items first. You need to deal with maybe the VIPs. You know, If your CEO comes to you and says, I need this done, and then you've got Joe Blow who asks you another thing, well, the CEO sometimes has a little bit more of a priority. If your manager asks you to do something, well, that's a little bit more of a priority. But also, here's the deal, is not just saying yes to absolutely everything. Because sometimes what I want to look for is I want to look for somebody who is willing to say no or willing to at least explain to me that they can't get to that right now. So let's say if I'm your manager and I ask you, hey, John, I need you to go and uh, deploy a new patch to this server in the next hour. And you're looking at your plate and you've got all of these tickets that are unresolved and you've got all of these emails and Teams messages that you need to get to. How am I going to do that? Now, this is more important. Well, you need to tell me. So I want to know that you won't just say, yes, Emilio, I will do that for you. I want to know, actually, no, I can't do that right now because these are the things that are on my plate right now. Are you happy if I get to that in the next two hours or three hours? I need to understand what your competing tasks are. So really, this is not so much about how you manage your time, which I think is very, very important, but also how do you manage competing requests from lots of different sorts of people. I'm going to want to also know a little bit more about your storage experience. Now, uh, depends on the company and the company size. Some companies may actually have dedicated storage people, people who are storage engineers, storage administrators, and they're the ones responsible for all the day-to-day -day storage. But I want to know from you, what is a SAN and what is a NAS? Give me your scenario. Give me your experience of using NASs and SANs in the past. Give me an example of why I would pick one over the other. I have a virtualization environment. I need to connect it to some storage. How do I do that? So this is where it's important for you to define these terms. Understand about storage area networks, SAN. Understand about network attached storage, NAS. Understand that SANs are block-based, that SANs use like an iSCSI protocol or they use fiber channel and they connect to your virtualization platforms that way. Understand that NAS devices are file-based. They're gonna be using SMB protocols or NFS protocols. NASs can be used for like a file server alternative. So the answer isn't which one is better, they're different, they're different purposes. So a NAS device could be used a lot for storing of all of your files, of all of your data. They can be the spot where you stick all of your backups, for example. While a SAN may be more because it's block-based, may be used as the storage for a VMware environment, setting it up as a data store. Explain to me maybe a little bit about the, the hardware configurations, right, that they've got. They're just very fancy storage computers. They've got all the bits of a computer. They've just got a lot of disks. They can take SATA disks. They can take SSDs. You set them up in storage pools. You've got RAID groups. 
Here's where you maybe talk a little bit about RAID, RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5. You understand the differences about the mirroring components, that you understand that there's failover in different RAID configurations. There's parity bits in like a RAID 5, for example, where you can lose the disk and you're fine. But ultimately, I want to know that you know about SAN and NAS devices, because even though you may or may not be directly responsible for managing these devices, the server tech that you're going to be managing, the virtualization tech, the cloud tech that you're going to be using, need storage of some sort, right? need storage. If we're talking about on the cloud, well, you don't have necessarily a physical NAS or SAN. You've now got cloud versions of that storage. You've got storage on the Microsoft Azure side. You've got AWS storage like S3 buckets. You've got different sorts of storage on the cloud. I also want to know about backups. How do you back up things? Why is it important to do backups? What is a disaster recovery plan? I want to know about backups. How often should I be doing backups? Well, every day, every week, every month. You should be doing different types of backups, incremental backups, full backups. Incremental backups being that I'm only backing up the changes of the files. Maybe you do an incremental backup every single day and you do a weekly backup that is a full, a monthly backup that is a full. I want to know that these backups are going to multiple locations. Like in backup world, there's this thing called a 3 2, one model where you're backing up three copies to different sorts of medium. You may be backing up to tape. You may be backing up to hard drives. You're backing up to the cloud. You're backing up to another storage device. Yeah, I want to understand where your backups are going. What if I've got backups on a server or on a NAS that's sitting next to my production server and then I lose my cabinet? I lose my backups and I lose my server. So I want to know that your backups are going off site and also that those backups have a retention period assigned against them. What's a retention period? Well, how long can I keep those backups for before they become expired? Yeah, so I want to back up maybe every single day. I send those backups off site and maybe legally I have a requirement to keep those backups for seven to 10 years. I need to understand that. And Together with that, I also want to be sure that those backups are working and they're working successfully, that I have monitoring, that I have logs against my backups, and also maybe that you have a routine in place to test those backups, to make sure that those backups actually work. I want to know how you're managing your endpoints and your servers. I want to know how you are patching your endpoints and your servers. What is the patching technology that you're using? Do you understand about WSUS or SCCM? When you're talking about physical stuff on-premise, well, WSUS and SCCM being Microsoft technologies for patching your environment. You're patching different sorts of things. I want to understand here that Microsoft released patches on a Tuesday, Patch Tuesday, they call it. I want to know what sort of patches are being released, the different levels of criticality, the different types of patches. I want to understand what your process is for patching a computer. Do you automatically patch a computer or do you schedule it to patch at a specific point in time. Are you testing the patches before you're deploying them? I mean, we remember a little while ago, there was this CrowdStrike outage where just there were just patches deployed without really any adequate testing potentially done beforehand. Some of those things may have been avoided. So I wanna make sure that you are patching things, that you are testing those patches before they're being deployed out to your entire fleet of systems. We're then talking about stuff that's a little bit more advanced from a cloud perspective, or well, Microsoft have got like the Intune side of things. Like Intune is used really, really well now for patching of stuff from a Microsoft 365 perspective. Apart from Microsoft, there's lots of other tools out there to allow for patching of operating systems. The Linux side has its own thing. The Mac has its own fleet of apps to patch those operating systems. But then there's also software packages out there to be able to patch apps, to actually patch apps themselves, not the operating systems, but apps. I want to know a little bit more about that. Ultimately, I just want to understand what is your patching process? What is the framework that you follow? And how do you patch? I need to understand about security. I want to know a little bit more about data. How do you do data management? I want to understand you as a person. That's the big thing that I'm looking for. I want to understand you as a person, you as a tech, and don't just tell me the correct answer, but give me experiences about that. Now, very dependent on the company, you may get asked stuff around DevOps because DevOps is like a big thing. DevOps or DevSecOps, where we're talking about development and operations, development, securing operations, having these merging of departments where developers used to be on their own, 
operations people used to be on their own, but now there's a lot more working together to make things work better. So you understanding a little bit about DevOps, the DevOps models will be also really, really helpful. If you wanna be able to frame some of your questions correctly, use the STAR method. The situation, the task, the action, and the result. What was the situation? What was the task that you had to do? What was the action that you took? And what was the result at the end of it? So framing your questions, framing your answers around this little star metric will be really, really helpful. So let me know down below in the comments, are there other questions that you have received? Love to do another video in future that will help me out if you let me know as well. Subscribe as well, click on the button on the bell. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you on the next video.